John Bonine is a broker of ideas, a connector of scholars, a viral communicator who turns perfectly nice, reliable lawyers into green crusaders in black gowns. He was once Associate General Counsel of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Then he joined the faculty of the University of Oregon, where he created the Western Environmental Law Clinic, which was the world's first environmental law clinic. He also established the annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, the largest such conference in the discipline, which is operated entirely by students and known in some circles as the Woodstock of environmental law. Internationally, he's the co-founder of ELAW, the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, which connects 300 environmental lawyers in 70 countries. He's also an active member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which bills itself as the world's largest and most diverse environmental network. The key word in all of this is network. One environmental lawyer can't do very much, but a thousand activist lawyers working in harmony? Now we're talking. And global networks of environmental lawyers all learning together, encouraging one another, supporting one another? That's a powerhouse. And John Bonine is its architect. John, people talk loosely about environmentalists and environmental actions and so on and so forth. There's some phrases that are sometimes not terribly complimentary that they use, and one of them is tree huggers, and another is the kind of people who care about the spotted owl. But you're the guy that really cared about the spotted owl. The spotted owl litigation, which people know about, uh, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, that is uh, preserving the old growth forests, um, because of the need to preserve the northern spotted owl. Let's say it started with scientists, it moved into popularizers, and from there it moved in litigation, and from there it moved into politics. What I mean is, it really started with a number of scientists at Oregon State University, uh, headed up by Jerry Franklin, and it was, I don't know if they had an official name, but it was the old growth scientific team. They had people studying, for example, root rot. How do the roots of trees rot? And how does that involve, uh, result in uh, nutrients coming back into growing trees? They had another person who uh, took climbing equipment and went up an old growth tree and counted 1,000 species in one tree. Um, so they had this team, they had the stream team and the, the erosion team and all these people. Um, and their work came to the attention of some environmentalists, uh, in particular uh, a, a woman at the University of Oregon, or, or her husband who was a chemistry professor, she was a, a birder, a Lane County Audubon Society person. And, uh, and she and a, and a young woman named Cameron La Follette um, started this idea that we ought to educate people about what the scientists are learning. So they had a series of seminars and Cameron published a little pamphlet book called Saving All the Pieces based upon a statement of, I think it was John Muir, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. And this then led, I, I came out here at the beginning of 1978 after leaving the Environmental Protection Agency and started teaching. Uh, and in that summer, I went to a one-week short course put on by these scientists. Uh, and then Sidney Herbert, the, the, the woman I mentioned with the Audubon Society, um, she wanted uh, the clinic, which we had just started, the Environmental Law Clinic at the law school, uh, to look into a plan of the Bureau of Land Management which they said would protect spotted owls, but when they looked at the numbers, they were decreasing the numbers of spotted owls to the level that they said would protect them. So we called it an owl reduction plan, not an owl saving plan. Um, we then took that through administrative appeals, uh, and Mike Axline was my student at the time. Uh, he took this, he then went away after he graduated, clerked for the Supreme Court of Idaho, came back and we hired him as co-director of our clinic. And the reason we had to hire him is that the timber industry had created such a fuss on other work we were doing uh, that they ended up pushing off campus another lawyer who was working with us. So we hired Mike, and, uh, and after uh, a, a couple of years, Mike came to me and said, John, all the administrative appeals are done, um, and our client has gone to every major national environmental law firm, all the well-known nonprofits, and none of them are willing to bring her case because they say it's too politically risky. Can you think of an idea why we shouldn't 
continue with the case now into court. It didn't occur to me there was any problem. We're simply the public law school in the largest timber producing state in the United States. No, I couldn't think of a reason why uh, our clinic shouldn't bring the case, and uh, so we did. <laughs> As a result, uh, the timber industry erupted. Uh, pressure was put on the university to cancel our clinic, and a number of other things happened. Uh, but meanwhile, the case went through court. Other groups joined in. The uh, Earth Justice joined in. Uh, at the time, its name was Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Uh, different cases were brought. Different pieces of the puzzle, let's say, were put together, resulting in the early 1990s, among other things, in the President of the United States and the Vice President coming out to Portland, Oregon, and holding a summit and eventually developing a plan to protect old growth forests. So people know about the spotted owl often, they know about big old trees. What they don't know is that the legal parts of it, the legal, the litigation, started with a bunch of law students at the University of Oregon. And those law students were in that, in that clinic because you had seen a lack of capacity in the environmental community with respect to legal, legal power. Right? That's true. Um, I worked for the Environmental Protection Agency for six years, and many of my class, classmates from Yale Law School had created, for example, the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, with a grant from the Ford Foundation. And there were other contacts I had in the environmental community in Washington, D.C. And I saw these regulations going through and I could comment on them as a staff lawyer, but I couldn't necessarily stop them, and many of them were, were poorly done, they, they were inadequate scientifically, and they didn't put enough pollution control on industry. And so I mentioned to some of my friends, why aren't you suing us more? And they said, we're doing all we can. I said, no, but there's so much more that needs to be done, and you just need to file more lawsuits. And they said, John, we don't have the resources. I said, they don't need resources, just file the lawsuit. I'm, I just can't believe that these regulations could stand. They said, John, we don't have the resources. Well, I spent six years at EPA, and at the end, I was the head of the Air Pollution Division of the General Counsel's Office after I also had some other adventures, uh, uh, which perhaps you want to get into later. But uh, I left EPA so I could come back to the American West. I'm a Westerner, uh, and uh, I finally said, you know, I've got to get out of this, this uh, swamp, as I think a recent politician has called it, uh, and return to the West. Uh, and so I managed to get this job at the University of Oregon Law School. And um, I started working in this environmental law clinic, and I realized we don't have the resources. The environmentalists do not have all the resources. It's, it was not, even if there were some easy victories out there, we didn't have the resources to bring them. To, to bring the cases. So what could we do to increase the growth of the environmental law movement? That, that became my question. If I can just pause there for one second, what strikes me is the enormous responsibility that people like you are taking on and the complete lack of an understanding of what you had, in a sense, the future of the whole natural world in the Northwest in this case, it's all on the shoulders of a handful of people like you. You're the guys that are standing up for this kind of thing and you don't have much in the way of resources. I mean, this is, from the, this is a tragic situation, isn't it? Yeah, but um, what was the old military phrase? The, um, the impossible, uh, or the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little more time. Uh, so uh, the idea, I think the question is not, uh, you're right, the, the shoulders are not broad enough to do all the work, but that's why we needed to grow the number of shoulders. Yeah. That's why we needed to increase the number of people to do the work. So now, let me get you to resume the story. But it seems to me that it's worthwhile just pausing for a second and saying, you know, the natural world is being defended by this tiny handful of people. Well, can, and you, can you imagine that the, the ancient forests of Oregon, these huge trees that have been here, some of them for a thousand years, are being defended by a bunch of law students who don't even yet have a law degree? Absolutely. So we had several things going on. We had the clinic, which we started to do, and there was a great demand for that. A huge number of students at the University of Oregon come here to do environmental law. That is their purpose, and they joined the clinic, uh, among other things. The other thing that happened is I came here after graduating from law school, after being in the Army, after being at EPA, I came out here as an elitist. 
That is, I thought, get good grades, join the you know, top environmental law firms, whatever they might be, uh, and you'll have a good career. A student came to me after I'd been here about two years, and she said, John, we didn't go to Yale Law School, and we're not all in the top half of the class. Isn't there anything for the rest of us? And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that I had been saying, get the top grades so that you can get the jobs that are already out there, when what I should be doing is creating more jobs. Not having my students knock out a Yale or Harvard or Columbia or Stanford student, because what does that do to the environmental movement? Now, you have to understand, and I tell students this every year when they come, if you want to become rich, become an environmental lawyer. Because 95% of the environmental lawyers in the United States and elsewhere in the world work for business and industry and not to protect the environment. About 3% work for government and about 2% work for the public interest. 95%, they're not there. Well, I don't know why people think that if, if you're an environmental lawyer, you have to love the environment. Tell me a tax lawyer who loves taxes. Yep. Tax is a field of law, right? Criminal lawyers, no, they, they don't love crime, they work on both sides of the issue. Environmental lawyers, they work mostly against the environment. So the question is, how could that 2% become 2.1% or 2.2%? How could we grow more environmental lawyers? Part of the answer was that we, in addition to the clinic, which of course trying to turn out some new, but where are they going to go? So in 1983, some students came to us and they said, we'd like to hold a conference. Um, we said, what kind of conference? Mike Axline and I, the other professor, uh, were listening to them and we said, well, what do you have in mind? Well, we'd like to you know, have an environmental law conference. And we started thinking, well, what we need actually is three components. We need environmental lawyers. We need environmental law students. So that's the whole idea of the conference. And we need activists. And we conceived this idea that if we had this yeasty one, one, and one mix, this one third, one third, one third mix, the activists could find lawyers. The activists could also keep the lawyers honest or remind them of their true roots, why they're doing this. The students might find a job or at least a role model, right? And so everybody would then perhaps benefit. But we didn't know how to start a conference. So we said, well, if we want people to come, I guess. What if we invite them to be speakers, then they have to come. So we had 15 speakers and 75 participants. Now we have about 200 speakers, 150 panel discussions, a couple thousand participants. But it's not organized by the university, and it's not organized by the law school, and it doesn't receive money from the administration. Why? Because it's a student conference. It's continually student-run. Each generation brings in the next generation. First year students come in, the second and third year law students reach back, bring them into a party, take them rafting on the, on the Rogue River, uh, help them organize the conference, and then that generation becomes second year, then they bring in the next year. And this has happened for 35 years, these students doing this. And, it, and, and, and because they receive no support and don't want support, nobody can tell them what to do. So they can do whatever they want in terms of speakers. Nobody can say, that speaker is a little, I don't agree. Why don't you have Exxon? No, no, this is not an environmental law conference. It's a public interest environmental law conference. And it's one to which environmental lawyers come back year after year to reconnect with each other as well and to learn about new issues. And, the, and, and to which activists come and say, oh, I wonder if that person would help me. So that's, that's part of this growth of an environmental bar outside of just the nonprofit organizations that are already have money, already getting foundation funding, but what else can we do? So then the next idea that connected to that, or it was connected in, in the beginning as well, was put a name on this. Can we take, can we encourage people to become environmental lawyers who don't already have jobs set up for them, but go out on their own? with no foundation money, with no donations. How could we do that? And the answer that occurred to me was that they have to have politically and ideologically compatible law practices. 
So there's a great myth among people and certain even law students when they start out that lawyers walk both sides of the street. It's not true. If you are a labor lawyer, you either work for management or for labor unions. You don't do both. If you're a criminal lawyer, you either work for the prosecution or the defense. You don't do both. And so you cannot at the same time go to a big private law firm, represent companies during the day, and represent the Sierra Club or somebody else at night. Because, not because there's a true conflict of interest, but because the law firm won't let you do it. We have this idea of pro bono law, pro bono for the good of the public law. But the only pro bono law you're really allowed to do is pro bono that doesn't disrupt the major clients of your law firm. And I call it clean pro bono. So you get to do you know, a little civil rights litigation here, maybe work on a school board, work for the opera, you know, occasionally do a big human rights case, but one that doesn't involve any of your institutions because they, your other clients, will say, why is that person doing that? You know, we don't like that kind of person in your law firm. So the only pro bono work that can really be done against big institutions is pro bono work that doesn't conflict with the client base of that lawyer. That's why I say an ideologically compatible, politically compatible client base. If you represent people for employment discrimination, if you represent injured people, if you take court-appointed criminal defenses, if you uh, do certain, uh, uh, let's say, uh, plaintiff's uh, toxic tort law, et cetera, then you can also devote some of your time to the public interest because there's no conflict and nobody's demanding you stop doing it. So that becomes what I named the private public interest bar and I wrote a law review article about it in 1986 giving it the name and it's now become a, a more accepted term. It turns out that half of the public interest environmental lawyers in the United States don't work in the names of the organizations that people hear about. They don't work for Sierra Club or Earth Justice or Eco Justice in Canada or anybody else. They are private lawyers, half of them, 350 in the nonprofits, 350 working for themselves, but on the right side of the street. Is there enough of a client base to support those, that, that number of lawyers? Ah, the client base. And what We're is the client base for a lawyer like that? Uh, the client base is the trees, the frogs, the birds. Um, the clients are humans, uh, but they don't have the money to bring these lawsuits. But keep in mind that the other half of a person's law practice is money making. So you get the income from one set of clients and you do the environmental cases without charging people. Of course, if you have some land use disputes, you, know, you, you may have some environmental, quasi-environmental, but not, not, not against the environment. So you may have an expertise there. And you do have people. Maybe if you uh, do divorces, then you know, your clients are paying you for that. But there's another but secret. But you've got, in a sense, two practices, right? Your you've got two practices. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But how do you fund the public interest environmental practice is another interesting question. In 1973, approximately, early 70s, after the Alaska, Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline litigation, environmentalists who won the litigation, they won it in court, they went to the courts and they said, now we should get our attorney fees paid by the government. And the US Supreme Court ruled, that's not America, that's Britain. Britain, each side pays, the, the loser pays the winner. In America, everybody bears their own expenses. The environmentalists thought that was a defeat. It was the greatest thing that happened to environmental litigation. Why? Because after that, Congress started passing laws, and it already had passed some, saying if you beat the government, the government has to pay you. You don't have to pay the government because they're already being paid by the taxpayers. But if you represent the public interest and you win your case, Freedom of Information, Clean Water Act, Clean Endangered Species Act, those things, then attorney fees can be paid to you because you served the public. You did the job that the government should have done. And that ability to earn attorney fees from successful environmental cases is part of the mixture. That's remarkable because it seems so appropriate. You're, you're not serving a private interest. You're winning these cases for a public interest. Yeah, but that's not the way a good deal of government has operated in the last, you know, generation or so. Well, it turns out that in the United States, um, there are 
about 200 statutes awarding attorney fees to successful litigants, but not awarding them against unsuccessful litigants. That is, if the government loses, it pays. There are about 2,000 state statutes doing this. In 1980, Congress passed a, a law called the Equal Access to Justice Act. And interestingly, it was not the environmentalists or the uh, civil rights organizations or, or anybody else who promoted that statute. It was small business. Small businesses said, sometimes the government comes after us, and it's wrong. You know, and we win, but meanwhile, we bankrupted our company just paying for lawyers. So we should be able to defend ourselves against the government so that if they're wrong and we're right, they should pay for the lawyers that we had to have to defend ourselves. And if a small business needs to litigate against the government because it doesn't like the regulations, it should begin. If it wins, if it's right, the court says it's right, it should get fees. And the environmentalists sort of watch this happening and then put in the nonprofit, not just the environmentalists, the nonprofit groups, so it became part of the law. And the Equal Access to Justice Act provides that if it's not covered by another law, it's covered by this law, if you beat the government, you should be paid your fees. It is American democracy. Well, yeah, it's a remarkably enlightened approach, isn't it? <laughs> and, Absolutely. Uh, because really what it's saying is you brought the case, yeah, you're the litigant, but you're supporting a general public interest, and then the country's better off for your efforts if you win, and they're proven to be right then, yeah? Yep, but, that's uh, the way it works. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, so we've gone away from that. You've been working on building capacity and building resources, and, but you continued on from that. So there's the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, of which this is the 35th incarnation, and I feel tremendously privileged that we've been asked to come here for that. And you gave a great keynote, a keynote speech. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. I'm very grateful that you feel that way because it was an occasion that just that warranted the best thing we could do, you know? But you've, had a, you've gone on to do a number of other things that build resources and capacity in this field. Tell me about some of those. Let's trace it back to, in part, to the Public Interest Law Conference and to the clinic. Um, in 1987, I had my first sabbatical. Um, every seventh year, a uh, professor is allowed to take off either a half a year at full pay or a full year at half pay and do research, do other, you know, get out of your skin, get new ideas, new teaching ideas, and so forth. Um, so I took my sabbatical in 1987 uh, and decided to travel first to Europe, then to uh, Kenya, the United Nations Environment Program, and then uh, to uh, India, uh, Nepal, Thailand. And I ended up in Malaysia at an environmental conference created by a bunch of environmental lawyers and environmentalists. Uh, and at the conference, uh, I guess really three things happened that, that eventually led to e-law. Um, the first one was that I met some people from uh, some labor activists who had created, even this was four or five years before the internet, had created an email link between labor unions in Asia. And I listened to that, I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting way to connect people. The second thing is that I met people at the conference who were doing environmental law uh, in Malaysia and other Asian countries, and they all had the same problem. They were alone. There was nobody else in the country except them doing this. They were sometimes under threat. Their parents, if they were young lawyers, were saying, why are you doing this stuff when you should be making money in a big law firm? And so it occurred to me that maybe we had something in common. That was the, the beginning. The other thing that happened is I was supposed to give a lecture on the Freedom of Information Act, and I had just discovered that it was available to people from other countries, that our law does not require you to be a U.S. citizen. So instead of giving a lecture, I told everybody, uh, get out a piece of paper and a pen, okay, you're going to write your first Freedom of Information request to some part of the U.S. government that maybe has information that will help you in your local environmental battle. And we did that, and I had them conceive of it, write it down, and I said, oh, and then put at the end, um, P.S., my lawyer is Professor Mike Axline at the University of Oregon. Contact him with any questions. I forgot to tell Mike about this. Um, <laughs> but he started to get inquiries from Indonesia, and so, oh, I'm having trouble with the State Department, can you help me? So I, that was the idea of information flowing over national boundaries. So you've got information that needs to be sent across boundaries. You've got the need for moral support. Um, you've got uh, the need for ideas being transmitted and so forth. Then in 1988, Mike and I went to Australia 
And uh, in that particular trip, we met a number of environmental lawyers again, uh, including some who were fighting against a pulp and paper mill, which we had been uh, fighting those issues back in Oregon involving dioxin contamination. As it turned out, a new pulp and paper mill was being proposed on the island of Tasmania, and we had friends in Oregon who had just done a study for Greenpeace on dioxin contamination, and we just bought a fax machine in our clinic, so we said, would you drive to Eugene and fax us your report? They sent the report down, uh, and we finished our lectures. We gave, handed it to the two members of the parliament who were worried about this, and we got ready to go hiking. And the phone rang in the house of one of them who was hosting us, and he turned to us and he said, you really want to go hiking? We said, of course we want to go hiking. That's, that's, that, you know, we've done our work. It's time to enjoy. He said, wouldn't you rather have a press conference in the parliament? Because they just released the environmental impact statement from the pulp mill. So we said, okay, we'll have a press conference. And instead of the headlines being, pulp mill finds no problem, it was foreign experts charge dioxin cover-up. And so with this, and with meeting a couple lawyers in Australia, we came back to Oregon and thought, you know, there's something here. There's something about connections that we're not seeing. And what can we do? And then one of them, those Malaysian lawyers that we'd met got imprisoned by the uh, Malaysian government um, because she was too much of an activist in one of her cases. And so we invited her to come to the Public Interest Law Conference. Uh, and that was in 1989, March. Uh, that was the first time when we had people from a number of different countries. And we all were listening to each other's stories. And we sat down at a lunch table afterwards and said, let's create something new. Let's create a network. And one person from Australia said, let's call it ELAW. We said, what does that stand for? He said, I don't know, let's figure that out, but ELAW sounds good. So Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide. That's how ELAW came about. And then we did fundraising and created a network, and now it's grown and grown and grown to be 300 lawyers in 70 countries who are all doing the same stuff uh, and uh, helping each other across national boundaries. And that's, that's another of the networking stories, I guess, that I think is important to build the movement everywhere. Yeah, that's right. And bringing those people together, you're supporting each other, but you're also sharing resources and you're knowing what the precedents are. But there's something else there, because you're also generating a global response to what are very often global issues. I mean, the air pollution that you're dealing with in Oregon is not necessarily air that came from Oregon in the first place. Well, that's true. Um, Often, though, it's the ideas that become global more, and the pollution is becoming global, you're right. Well, and the trade arrangements and the, you know, but, the And the economy, trade arrangements you know, all and, stuff, and yeah. all those things. Yeah. Um, to take an example of that, there was a, 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 a ship um, bearing toxic wastes uh, leaving England and looking for a place to dump its wastes improperly and activists notified us and they were able to sort of track where that ship was going and in each country we alerted through the Elon network lawyers who could then raise a ruckus and prevent the ship from docking and eventually it had to go back to England. Perfect example. Yeah, exactly. But in a sense, as human beings, and in a world of globalized economies and global corporations, we really need to develop these tools. We do, but let me, let me put it in another way, because you've emphasized the globalization, and you know the old phrase, uh, think globally and act locally. For us, that is also key to ELAW, to its concept, and to our domestic networks here in the United States. What I mean is this. If you come from a big environmental organization in Toronto or, or in Washington, D.C., you know, or, or, or in Berlin or someplace, and you want to go save the Sahara Desert, save the Amazon rainforest, can you really do that when you don't live there, when you're not part of that society? No, what you can do is run down there, make a splash, bring a case, maybe you win it, maybe you lose it, and leave and go back home. Now, have you accomplished anything? Yes, one thing you've accomplished. You've undercut the legs out of the local people who would have done the work. You've convinced people in that country, if you want a real lawyer, go to Washington, D.C. But that's not true. You want the lawyer who lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and is going to live there for the rest of her life. That's the person you need to encourage. So when ELAW gets a request from Cambodia, for example, 
from an environmentalist or a citizen and says, I need help stopping this destructive dam, our first question is always, do you have a lawyer? If they have a lawyer, then say, put your lawyer in touch with us, we want to work with your lawyer, because it's your lawyer locally who's important. Well, I don't have a lawyer. Let us try to help you find one, because we will not bring our resources to bear in your country. We only want to help you grow the resources in your own country. And the same thing is true to some degree in the United States. Back to the private public interest bar that I mentioned. We're growing, we're, we're helping that there be environmental lawyers everywhere in North America, not just the big funded law firms for nonprofit good work that they do, and they do, that are in DC or Seattle or San Francisco. We want people in Eastern Oregon. We want people in Northern Idaho. Uh, because those are the people who are going to live there, and if they fight a case, the citizens are going to respect them, maybe bring them you know, their real estate transactions, you know, because, oh, this lawyer actually is, is a good person, uh, and that person will be there to fight that for 20 years. They don't just do a little fundraising and run away. So I actually believe that all the major national environmental law firms should be required to have a local council in any state where they don't, if they don't have their own office there, if they go to, um, let's say, to Nebraska, they shouldn't be allowed to, they should dissuade themselves from going to Nebraska without finding a local lawyer who they will support and grow the capacity in Nebraska. Yeah, right. And it's, but that does ultimately come out to be both local and global, right? Because you're no, now yeah, having a The effect is global. Yeah. And, uh, and the work is, so it's, it's linking together localities in order to create a global impact. But the linkage and the localism is really important. And this should encourage young people, it should encourage uh, law students, those who are thinking maybe, maybe I should go to law school. They should not just think I'm gonna have to move to New York or, or, you know, or to Ottawa in order to do that. They should think I can do this in my own town and I can do it by creating a law practice that allows me to go home and sleep well at night. You know, people talk about sacrificing. Public interest environmental lawyers don't sacrifice. I mean, you don't have as much money, okay, but the people who sacrifice are in tall glass towers in Manhattan because those people have given up their ideals. And our network, our local and domestic and national, international network, Nobody gives up their ideals. You saw, you met some of them at our, at our, at our meetings here. You know that they, they do this for love. And public interest law is a labor of love. And we've met a number of them otherwise, and who turn out to be old friends of yours and connections through and otherwise, yeah? That's interesting because one of the things that always strikes me is when you've got, say, an environmental feature, you know, a lake, a river, a forest, whatever, and you've got key people who care passionately about that and who are thinking in the aboriginal sense of seven generations hence, what am I leaving for my grandchildren's grandchildren, and they're confronting a corporation, I often wonder how the people in the corporation contrive not to think about those things. There's some ability to segment, for some people, to segment their lives and to leave what they're doing during the day and go home and play Little League with their kids, play soccer, and feel wonderful. But I think it's because they don't think about what they're doing or because they've rationalized it. I don't know if most professions have this. I find that lawyers have a huge ability to rationalize what they're doing. And, and the reason I think is this. People make mistakes all the time. So if you're fighting the government, for example, even if you're working for Exxon, you're fighting the government. They're making mistakes, the government. I'm a lawyer. I'm fixing mistakes. I'm in the side of the angels. I only do good stuff because they're making mistakes and I'm correcting them. Well, fine. But it's a scale. Which side are you going to put your thumb on? There's always mistakes, but maybe we should spend more time correcting the mistakes that harm the environment. I entirely agree, but I just, I just often wonder about the rationalizations that must go on in the minds of people whose, you know, activities ultimately are very damaging. Well, what they enter into is a bargain. And if they're not careful, and many of them are not careful, they get what we call the golden handcuffs. The golden handcuffs. They're made of gold, and they're going to spend the rest of their life going to fancy resorts and 
flying in first class, but they are handcuffs. And they won't have the same sense at the end of their lives that they saved a river. Neil Kagan is such a great example. One of my students, back in 1980, he came out here before law school. Actually, he came out in 78, graduated in, uh, in 80, 81. Uh, he came out uh, and said, I want to work with your clinic. And we said, well, you haven't started school. He said, I don't care. I'm a scientist also. Let me help. And so we worked together to fight pesticides. Um, Neil graduated. Um, he went down to Roseburg, Oregon, because his wife found a job there. And so he, they agreed whoever got the first job, that's where they would go. And he brought a case to protect uh, Oregon, wilderness areas in Oregon, undeclared wildernesses, that is, areas that were still roadless. He brought this amazing case, and he stopped all of the logging of untouched areas in Oregon. And as a result, our U.S. Senator, Mark Hatfield, had to get off the dime and agree to negotiate a wilderness bill. Up to that point, no, up to that point, no more wilderness. But he had no choice now, because the only way to allow some logging again was to reach a, a compromise with the environmentalists. A million acres of new wilderness and protected areas were declared as a result of that legislation. And what did Neil get for it? He had a bottle of water sitting behind his desk. His clients gave him a bottle of water from a creek that will never be eroded and never touched by industry or by logging. That's his pay. And he's a happy man. That's pretty wonderful, isn't it? That, that's pretty wonderful. Another one of the connections that you've made is the connection between environmental law and human rights. And that seems to me to be an incredibly powerful thing, but it wasn't, they weren't seen as being connected even when you started. But let me be honest. The connection was made my, by my late wife, Professor Svetlana Kravchenko. She was an environmental law professor in Ukraine for about 30 years. Uh, we married. Uh, she, back in 2001, she died five years ago, but she, we married in 2001, and she went to a conference in Geneva of human rights lawyers and environmental lawyers to try to bring these things together. And it was a good conference. They had good research, good papers, and so forth. But after that, she thought, well, that's not enough. So she conceived the idea of a teaching book. Uh, and so, indeed, and then she said to me, well, you're going to probably help me with editing anyway, because I'm not a natural English speaker, so why don't you be my co-author? So I became her co-author, but it was her idea. And the book is called Human Rights and the Environment, and it's a book of cases from all over the world, things that we found without going into normal electronic resources. We found them because people sent them to them, and we sat there and retyped them and turned them into this book. Uh, and that book is, I think, an important part of the development of human rights and the environment, but of course it's grown much beyond that. It's not only us, it's not only Svetlana, it's certainly not me. Uh, it's a lot of people who recognize that you cannot have civilization if the planet has been destroyed. And therefore, it has to be a fundamental right. Now where you find it, you now start to put it into different international instruments, uh, treaties, maybe a little bit here, a little bit there. You took it old treaties and, 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 and so forth. So reinterpret things there. Uh, you draft new constitutions. There's about a hundred around the world now that have an environmental right in them. All these things have been sort of growing, and so I don't want to claim any credit, or even for the two of us, but rather for recognizing it and helping grow it. And it's been growing because of a lot of people who understand it's not just about politics. It's about our future. Well, and what we've been finding in our research is that that ultimately circles back to an understanding of where you are in the world as part of the world community, part of the life community of the world. And that brings you back very closely to the indigenous people. Well, that's for sure. And one of the, to me, one of the most interesting things is how uh, indigenous people have stood up for themselves, uh, taken their own rights that they had from time immemorial or that they had recognized in Indian treaties and have turned those into a demand that they not be sort of steamrolled by progress without having a say and a participation in it. So indigenous rights uh, are, and we have a whole chapter in our book on that, are a key part of environmental rights. And those rights being asserted by the indigenous people on their own behalf also preserved for the rest of us. That's right. They benefit all of us. So 
a case up in Washington State recently, took a treaty that's 150 years old and said if, if said it preserved to Native peoples the right to take fish in the accustomed areas in common to the citizens, and the U.S. Court of Appeals in San Francisco ruled just this past year uh, that that treaty means that you have to start removing barriers to fish migration that the state of Washington has created by having inadequately designed culverts and bridges under roads. You have to change those culverts so that the fish can swim through them. And they're going to restore uh, thousands of miles uh, of potential habitat by the time this treaty is fully implemented on the ground now in the 21st century based upon words from the 19th century that the indigenous people were wise enough to put in their treaty they couldn't see how it would be applied, but they knew that they had to have the right to continue living their, their life with fish. And that benefits all of us as the fish can be protected and come back. I don't know. I don't know the situation in the States as well as I do the one in Canada. The problem we've had in Canada is the trees are there, the rights are there, and they've not been respected. And it's been, again, there hasn't been the resources, there hasn't been the capability, I think, in a lot of cases, to insist on them although that's changing quite rapidly, but... It's true everywhere. The rights are always on paper, and that's why we need more environmental lawyers. I think the indigenous people always have this understanding that they are a part of the world they inhabit. They're not separate from it. They're not, you know, and if it's suffering, if it's suffering, ultimately they are suffering. I think it's true for indigenous people um, because we've relegated them, we, we, you know, we've stuck them off on reservations and on areas and sort of, uh, so they've stayed close to the land. But I think for non-indigenous people, those who raise their kids in the outdoors, those who raise their kids hunting and fishing, those who raise their kids camping, don't have that much different a connection to the earth than indigenous people. It's the people who, you know, live on pavement all their lives who have to be reintroduced, I think, to to these concepts, but I think even they can, they can recover them. It doesn't seem to be just one set of indigenous people. It seems any country you go to, there's, two, there's a real movement of people sort of saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've developed a world in which the kids don't want to go outside because there's no electrical outlets. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we've got to go and do a real, make a real change there, you know. <laughs> That's that, true. Uh, this is not reality. <laughs> That's this is true. A, That's true. This is, you know, virtual is reality is not reality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's taken us a long time, I think, to understand what, we've, what our kids have lost because of the way we've developed our world. Yeah, it's, it's sad. I hope there's still time. I don't know. Another area that I wanted to ask you about is information rights. Because when we've been talking, in the work we've been doing with environmental rights, they've been substantive rights generally. You know, the right to clean air, the right to fresh water, all that sort of thing. But you had a real emphasis on information rights. And I'd like to have you explain to me why that matters so much. Sure, we, we divide rights into substantive rights and procedural rights. Substantive rights means eventually they can't take them away and you win and you stop a project, for example. Procedural rights mean you get the procedures that may or may not help you win, but at least you have democracy along the way. And so we identify uh, what we call three, the three pillars of environmental democracy. The right to information, the right to public participation, and the right to justice, the right to go to courts. So information, participation, and justice. Um, those are recognized in 1992 in the Rio Declaration, the declaration coming out of the UN Conference on Environmental, uh, uh, Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro in 92, in Principle 10, the three pillars. That was, uh, in Europe, turned into an international treaty called the Aarhus Public Participation Convention. It's now being negotiated in Latin America and the Caribbean as another legal treaty, legal instrument that will help. And we've had freedom of information in the United States in the federal government since 1966. In state governments, 400 years or more. Sweden has had it for 250 or 300 years in their law. Information is crucial to protecting the environment. It's, it's, in some ways, it's the most fundamental right because it allows you to participate not just in the courts where you enforce substantive rights, 
but in the political process. And in the end, if we don't have access to the political process, access to the real story, I mean, fake news is our enemy, and there really is, more than that, hidden news, hidden information. And through freedom of information, we get the documents. I want to quote another John Bonin maxim, which is, even if you're going to play poker with your mother, you still cut the cards. Uh, it's true, uh, but, but I, I Doesn't I didn't, that apply here? I, I didn't originate that. Uh, uh, my maxim is a little different. It's nothing is impossible. Nothing. No idea, no protection, nothing is impossible, just we have to try to do it. You're right, cut the cards if you're playing poker, even with your mother. But sometimes you don't even get the cards to play, and you have to build your own plan. Well, the application that made me think of that at that moment was that we also have in Canada freedom of information laws, but they are continuously being uh, sabotaged by the information when it comes is heavily redacted. It takes you five years to get it. The bureaucrat, you know, it's, I'm it's sure this is elsewhere. You know. It's the same. It's the same in America. It's the same in the University of Oregon. It's the same everywhere. And the state laws in, in, in Europe, uh, civil servants are reluctant to give out information much of the time because it creates unpredictability. You don't quite know what's going to happen next when people get hold of these things. Um, but to expect somehow the leopard to change its spots and people suddenly to, oh, take information when it might actually upset their life, it's not going to happen. So you'll never have good access to information, freedom of information, without lawyers. Here we are again, back to having lawyers to sue the bastards. Yeah. So. I've also wondered, Tony Oposa, whom I think we both know and admire very much in the Philippines, when he did that landmark case against Factoran on behalf of future generations, Factoran was privately delighted with that whole thing. And as Tony says, the legal action put the wind under his wings. Yeah. I've occasionally wondered if one of the most subversive things one might do would be to cultivate carefully relationships with civil servants in crucial spots, so that the less that they understand that you and they are in many cases on the same side. They'd like to do the right thing, and if you really go after them and put pressure on them, you in a sense allow them to stand up to the pressures on them. That's, right. That's absolutely right. Um, what I perceive the government is, is a bunch of, of, of trees or reeds, and if the wind comes always from industry, always from corporations, always from those favoring pollution, those trying to destroy the wilderness, the trees will bend, the, the wheat will bend. But if we can bring counter pressure, then those civil servants can do what they know is right. Because if we can create enough controversy on the other side, you know, we, can, we can accomplish that. Um, and we know they're already there. We know they're already there because we get documents in the mail in a plain brown envelope. Or as we say, I don't know where this document came from, but uh, it fell off the back of a truck that was driving through town. So we have people who will help inside, and they're doing their democratic thing because information should be free. And they, they, they will help, and they need to continue to help, maybe now more than ever. John Bonin, the world's great organizer in the field of environmental law. If you want to meet some of his friends and allies, take a look at our Green Rights film, or my book, Warrior Lawyers. Or look at our interviews with such towering figures as Antonio Oposa, Jr. in the Philippines, Roger Cox in the Netherlands, or his colleague at the University of Oregon, Mary Christina Wood. Right now, environmental law is one of the most exciting fields in the whole environmental movement. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Visit us again soon.